Hello and welcome everyone to the webinar on nutrient management. This webinar is the seventh in a series of nine webinars on soil health and organic farming organized by the Organic Farming Research Foundation and eOrganic with funding from the Clarence Heller Foundation. I'm your host, Alice Formiga of eOrganic. eOrganic has many articles, videos, and webinars about organic farming and research, and you can find them all by typing webinars by eOrganic into a search engine, and you can also find the recordings on the eOrganic YouTube channel. We are recording this webinar, and we will have the recording available on YouTube within one to two weeks. The webinar will last about an hour, and then when it's over, we'll have 30 minutes for questions. If you have a question at any time during the webinar, feel free to type it into the Q&A box on your webinar control panel. If you don't see the Q&A box, there should be a black bar with some controls at the bottom of your screen, and if you click on the Q&A one, that should pull it up. There's also a chat box, and there's the option to send a comment to panelists and also attendees, so you can use that as well. I'd like to welcome back our presenter today, um, Mark Schoenbeck. Mark Schoenbeck has been presenting all the webinars in this series, and he's a research associate at the Organic Farming Research Foundation. He has worked for 31 years as a researcher, consultant, and educator in sustainable and organic agriculture. He has also been very active in the Virginia Association for Biological Farming. So now, Mark, I'm going to hand over the remote control of the screen to you, and you should be able to click on your screen to activate it. Okay. Thank you. Welcome, everyone. Uh, today, we'll be talking about nutrient management um, and managing so that it benefits the crop, the soil, and the larger environment. Okay, so we'll start with a, a quick review of a, a large survey of organic farmers that Organic Farming Research Foundation conducted in uh, 2015. Uh, interviewed well over a thousand organic farmers across the country and Based on that, um, based on the survey and some listening sessions, they developed the 2016 National Organic Research Agenda. <clears throat> and uh, the leading organic farmer research priority was soil health. That was number one at 74% of them considered it a high research priority. Uh, nutrient management was approximately third. We had weed management up there around 70%. Uh, nutrient management uh, was also very high. Uh, and specific questions they had is how do you match uh, your nutrient inputs to crop needs, both in terms of amount and timing? And how do you minimize nutrient losses? Uh, there's an interest in nutrient efficient cultivars uh, of crops, and also how nutrient soil life and um, uh, pest resistance, uh, how nutrients in soil life interact and how the soil life helps crops acquire the nutrients. So as uh, underlying the comments was a strong interest in moving beyond input substitution and really looking at uh, a, a more sustainable organic approach to managing crop nutrients so you don't have to add so much. Okay, and then uh, one of the uh, foundational principles of organic farming ever since the beginning of the movement in the, in the early to mid 20th century is if you feed the soil, the soil will feed the plant. And that's based with an understanding that the soil is alive, uh, it's rich in microorganisms of all sorts, and that they in turn release nutrients to the crop roots, and then that supports your crop. And several aspects, uh, several characteristics of healthy uh, soils, in addition to the fact that they're alive, they're full of a very complex ecosystem of uh, many different kinds of organisms, is that this community retains and recycles plant nutrients so that uh, nutrient flows are more efficient. Uh, the soil nourishes crops from the nutrient reserves in the soil organic matter. And if you go out in nature or you, you go out in a, in a primary forest or a prairie, any natural ecosystem, that is the sole source of uh, the nutrients for the plants that are growing in that system. And another um, aspect of healthy agricultural soils is that they do minimize nutrient losses and thereby protect water quality. <clears throat> so here's the nutrient dynamics in a living soil, uh, a very rough, very simplified diagram. Um, basically anything that comes back to the soil, plant residues, manure, uh, 
uh, fertilizers and amendments um, are initially processed by the soil life. The bacteria and the fungi jump on those residues in the manure uh, right off the bat. And uh, those organisms tend to tie up the nitrogen and some of the other nutrients, which isn't all a bad thing because uh, if they didn't get tied up, they get washed out in the next heavy rain or uh, intense snow melt. And then what happens is as other organisms, little nematodes, which are barely visible to the naked eye, and then these protozoa, which are microscopic, but not as small as bacteria and individual fungal filaments, they're feeding on these guys and they don't need quite as much nitrogen. So they let some of it out. And then other organisms, larger organisms, not shown here in this uh, version of the diagram, uh, they will let even more nitrogen out as they continue to cycle this material. And then you have the large uh, critters, the earthworms and the um, insects and mites that you can actually see uh, in the soil if you look at it uh, with naked eye, they're kind of like running this whole mass through themselves continually and further promoting this process of, pro of um, first holding and then releasing nutrients. One thing that happens is these materials then get converted into soil organic matter, uh, which is then gradually drawn upon. Some of these organisms eat a, a fraction of the organic matter, which we'll talk about later, the active organic matter, and then recycle those nutrients. And again, that creates a slow, steady trickle of nutrients into the plant root zone. Also, some of these organisms and the plant roots themselves will access soil minerals in a way that very slowly over time solubilizes um, some of their nutrients, uh, phosphorus, potassium, many micronutrients, um, not so much nitrogen, that really is in the organic matter cycle and also from the atmosphere by, by nitrogen fixation. <clears throat> and more and more research has shown what a intimate two-way exchange occurs between the plant and the soil life. As the plant photosynthesizes, it sends a third to a half of its goodies underground, and some of that goes to grow, grow more roots, but some of it goes right out the roots to feed the soil life. And in return, the soil life helps the plant pick up uh, both the major and the minor nutrients. So there's this uh, return of nutrients to the top growth, uh, to the plant, and that en encourages even more growth and even greater capability of feeding the, the soil life. So um, there's a, a particular group of organisms that are especially important to note. Those are mycorrhizal fungi. A lot of you may be familiar with them, but in annual crops, the type of mycorrhizal fungi they associate with, they grow inside the root tissue. Now they don't actually penetrate the cells and parasitize them. They go between the cells and Maybe initially they're a little bit greedy about snatching those uh, plant uh, photosynthetic products before the plant can even release them to the soil, but that the fungi then grow out into the soil, doubling or tripling the effective root system and greatly enhancing water and nutrient uptake. So the plant ends up benefiting by giving uh, five to 15% perhaps of its energy directly to this particular group of organisms. Now, there are some plant families that don't enter into this particular uh, symbiosis. Uh, the brassica family, cabbage, uh, and um, cabbage, radish, cauliflower, uh, kale, et cetera. Um, and also the spinach and beet family don't do it, and the buckwheat family. However, they associate with other organisms that live in the rhizosphere or also in the root tissues that provide similar functions. But one of the things to remember is that uh, these mycorrhizal fungi, they also help stabilize soil organic matter. They build stable organic matter in the soil and they also protect the host plant from disease. It's like a, a, a disease, a, a pathogen comes along, tries to attack this root and it's covered in mycorrhizal fungi that are putting out um, antibiotics and otherwise de deterring the uh, pathogen. So it's many functions that this particular group of organisms performs uh, in relation to nutrient management and uh, plant health. <clears throat> so let's look what happens when the, the crops have enough nutrients, um, a well-nourished plant, there's usually three things working for it. It's what I call the triangle of soil health. Uh, never mind the disease triangle, let's get into the health triangle. That's good physical conditions so that the roots can go deep and wide. There's no hard pan, there's no surface crusting. Um, there's uh, good chemical conditions, like there is adequate amounts of the desired nutrients in the soil solution and adequate reserves in the soil that can gradually uh, continue to replenish 
uh, the soluble pool. And thirdly, but most important, is that the soil life is abundant and it's balanced and it's diverse. You have a fully functioning soil food web, and it's critical in uh, creating this uh, soil to plant uh, nutritional link. So several causes of uh, crop nutrient deficiency. On the left, you have a situation where you got a pretty good soil, but there's one nutrient that it's short in. For instance, very often the soils in the southeastern United States are short of boron. Um, in the uh, Great Plains, where the soils are somewhat alkaline, it's often short of iron or some other micronutrients. Also, phosphorus tends to get tied up. So there's a shortage of available um, uh, nutrients, and that'll slow crop growth down somewhat. Another thing that can happen is you have plenty of nutrients around, but the soil life has been depleted by either excessive tillage or maybe excessive nutrients, or perhaps the soil was fumigated recently. In any of these circumstances, or the soil simply hasn't been receiving enough organic inputs. There weren't any cover crops, there weren't any compost additions. So you have a depleted soil biota. So uh, the, the link breaks down here. <clears throat> the third situation is you can have a hard pan. And if you have a hard pan uh, severe enough to stop root growth at eight inches, look at all of this soil volume that the plants cannot access. So the first thing that's gonna happen is that plant's gonna be much more susceptible to drought because it doesn't rain for a week, the top eight inches dries out, can't get down there to pick up the, the subsurface reserves, but also nutrients. A lot of the nutrient reserve is also down here. So uh, the plants will be restricted in their ability to absorb uh, the nourishment they need. Another circumstance that can happen is something that I call a chemical hard pan. Uh, it's not an official soil science term at all, but it's how I think of it. When the subsoil is so acidic and low in organic matter, which often occurs in uh, some of the very highly weathered soils of the southeastern United States, you will have an excessive amount of aluminum available in the soil uh, solution in a, in a soluble form, and that stunts and inhibits root growth. So you may have a soil that doesn't have a bad physical hard pan, but the pH and the organic matter drop so that you have high aluminum and then the uh, roots can't penetrate. And sometimes there's a very specific remedy to that, either a highly, um, highly uh, pulverized limestone and or gypsum, the calcium tends to push the aluminum back out of solution. So that is a, a specific remedy for that. Although uh, in the long run, just good soil health building, deep root cover crops will relieve all of these conditions in different ways. So soil health and plant nutrients. <clears throat> Really good, healthy, living soil like that that's full of life, it's gonna grow beautiful crops. Your soil is a little bit below par. You can make them look like that, that good, uh, by adding uh, soluble uh, nutrients. And uh, you'll notice the school buses in the background. This is an urban farm in downtown Birmingham, Alabama. And I just wanted to point out that um, everything I'm talking about today can be applied to the urban farm as well as, as, as out in the country. Uh, same rules apply. Um, so yellow yeah, cover crops, uh, good crop rotation, uh, appropriate amounts of compost and manure, et cetera, uh, build soil health. One thing to remember is that soluble nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium, either from uh, synthetic fertilizers or even from faster release organic materials, will have something of a detrimental effect on soil health. Um, when they, at really high levels, you have a salt effect, is a salt stress, which is uh, um, directly harmful. But more subtly, if your phosphorus levels get too high or your nitrogen levels get too high, some of those highly beneficial organisms that help plants to um, obtain the nutrients they need from organic and slow release sources, uh, from organic matter, et cetera, those organisms are deterred by those high levels of nutrients, in particular, the mycorrhizal fungi, which I emphasize as being exceedingly important for uh, crop nutrition. If the phosphorus level is too high for any reason, whether it was um, superphosphate on a conventional farm, uh, manure on any farm, or organic compost used at rates beyond what is appropriate, uh, what is optimum, once that gets too high, the mycorrhizae go to sleep. And even though the plants may not be deficient in nutrients because you've loaded it up with compost, there are some of the other functions of the mycorrhizae, the uh, uh, water acquisition, the disease uh, suppression that you may lose. 
So let's look at the last century. This is how nutrient management looked like in the late 20th century on, on non-organic farms. Basically, in those days, soil life was, was disregarded. It just was ignored. And so based on research conducted on conventionally managed soils of crop responses to phosphorus and potassium, and then simply a total nitrogen consumption by crops. They don't even bother to measure soil nitrogen. They just say, okay, you're growing corn, you want 140 bushels per acre, you want 140 pounds of nitrogen. So those formulas were based on um, a feed the plant approach. And you say, okay, well, well, the advantage of this is you can say, okay, if we're gonna feed the plant very precisely, we can say, okay, we don't want too much phosphorus because it's already nearly optimal. And you can pick and choose your synthetic fertilizers. But of course, that's not organic farming. It is also not going to do anything for your soil life. And uh, the best labs will also look at other nutrients, micronutrients. And then uh, most of the labs, we're looking at uh, lime for pH. Uh, that remains pretty much valid. The only difference is how much lime that may be recommended. It might, it might be more than needed. Um, but this is pretty universal for organic and non-organic. Um, but because soil life is disregarded, the rates are determined by the expected crop response based on the soil test and this conventional um, research on conventionally managed fields. And then they say, oh, let's add a little bit more for insurance. We don't want to risk falling short and, and limiting crop uh, with not quite enough nitrogen, phosphorus, or potassium. So they tend to recommend more. Okay. Oh, I just want to add one thing. You, um, you may wonder why we're dwelling on 20th century conventional wisdom because 21st century, I'm very pleased to see that more and more um, extension services, university scientists and other agricultural service providers are embracing the importance of soil life and soil health in nutrition. And the main reason to dwell a little bit on what is left over from the 20th century is that a lot of soil test recommendation protocols are still based on that paradigm. It's taking time for the uh, clear understanding, uh, which I find um, exemplified in the Natural Resources Conservation Service. They've been leaders in, in uh, bringing the soil health and soil life message into uh, mainstream agriculture for about 10 years now. Um, and yet there are still some um, kind of leftovers from that 20th century paradigm, admittedly even in the nutrient management practice uh, standard itself in the in our NRCS. So we're in, a, we're in a transition right now. Anyway, so just wanna go quickly over a few of the nutrients that are critical for crop uh, growth uh, and talk about the forms they occur in the soil. Um, so the forms I'm writing out here are not in the organic matter. Uh, they are the inorganic forms that plants absorb what actually crosses the cell membrane of the plant is mostly inorganic nutrients, although now there's evidence that the plants can take up some simple amino acids as well as ammonium and nitrate. Uh, however, uh, these are the, um, these are the uh, forms of the nutrients that are looked at in soil tests and are considered in uh, uh, plant nutrition. Um, nitrate and, uh, is a, as an anion, now the anions, they will tend to leach out of the soil profile uh, with the exception of the phosphate anions, which are not all that soluble. They intend, tend, instead, they tend to get bound up in minerals or organic matter. Um, whereas if nitrate is not utilized while it's present, it tends to leach. And the same is true for sulfate, uh, which is another anion or negatively charged. Potassium, which is a, a major nutrient, and then also calcium and magnesium, which are secondary nutrients. Uh, also used in large quantities, but not as frequently yield limiting. Uh, these are all positively charged or cations, so they will adhere um, by electrostatic charge to the cation exchange capacity, the negative charges on the surface of soil clays and also soil organic matter. And in addition to these six major nutrients, we have uh, a number of micronutrients. Uh, these are elements that crops need in small quantities, but they're absolutely critical. Um, boron, as I mentioned, is often deficient in uh, southeastern, uh, eastern U.S. soils, high rainfall regions. Uh, copper and zinc, occasionally deficient in various soils. Um, iron is one that typically um, can be limiting on, uh, as I say, on the uh, lower rainfall, more alkaline soils. Uh, manganese, molybdenum 
um, is not on standard soil tests. It is needed in very tiny trace quantities, especially by uh, nitrogen fixing plants. Um, nickel is one that's come up uh, often in relation to pecan production, but all plants need a little bit of all of these. Now, sodium and chlorine are rarely deficient. And if anything, your biggest issue is whether there's too much of one or both of them because of a salt situation. Um, there are three other elements that plants don't use directly, but uh, it's really good that plants tend to absorb a little bit of them because they're essential to animal and human nutrition. That's cobalt, selenium, and chromium. So how does soil life and soil organic matter work in relation to nutrients? Well, this is basically what happens. In nature and in organic um, or, or agriculture and in other agricultural systems that use a lot of organic inputs, all the residues, it could be manure, it could be the in, in situ plant residues, it could be brought in mulch, et cetera. All of that is first digested by the soil life. And as that occurs, some of this material turns into what we call active soil organic matter. That's organic matter that turns over in months or years or maybe a few decades. And then some of it becomes more stable organic matter and its half-life is in the neighborhood of centuries to millennia. So the stable organic matter provides long-term carbon sequestration and long-term uh, structural benefits and water holding capacity to the soil. In addition, it has a, uh, a negative charge. It's even more effective in holding these cations, potassium, calcium, ammonium, magnesium, and some of the micronutrients like zinc, copper, and iron, even more effective than uh, soil clays. And in fact, a lot of stable organic matter is stabilized by the organic residues associating tightly with clays. You get a clay organic matter complex and that builds up this cation exchange capacity. Now the active organic matter, the nitrogen, phosphorus, and sulfur, those, cat, those anions that were in the residue, they get integrated into the uh, structure of the active organic matter. And the soil life continues to feed on this as, at a slower rate. It's like a, a food reserve. It's like the canned food, uh, as it were. Um, so the soil life is gradually feeding on that. And in effect, it gradually releases all of these nutrients that the anion nutrients are gradually released right, it, right to the plants. And then these by being held by the kind of exchange capacity uh, of, that is expanded by the organic matter is then available to plants as well. And of course, these nutrients also come originally from the residues. Okay, so the next step in uh, uh, organic nutrient management is what I call feeding the soil a balanced diet. And we see a number of different things here. We see the cover crops and the green manure as a cover crop being turned down. You can also mow and leave cover crops on the surface. Uh, crop residues, this is an example of a very high residue crop uh, grown up in central Vermont by Elliot Coleman. He planted sweet corn. And then and when the sweet corn was emerged, he planted soybean as a cover crop between the rows. The corn is long harvested. Uh, the so soybean hasn't been killed by frost yet, but it's gonna happen any day. But look at all of that residue that's going back and think of the roots under the surface. Organic mulches, uh, brought in organic materials, tree leaves, um, hay and straw. And then of course there's compost and manure. And one of the things you'll notice is that the majority of this balanced diet is plant derived materials. And really the staple in the organic, in, in the uh, life, the, the staple food for the soil life is what you grow. It's the cover crops, it's the high biomass cash crops, it's the diversity of crops in the rotation. These onions may not be contributing that much. You know, it's a small biomass here, especially when they're young, but if that's part of a rotation that immediately goes into a cover crop or into sweet corn or something like that, all of that is feeding the soil continually through the root exudates, same way over here. And so what you're bringing in is supplemental. And the reason to bring some materials in is that when you're harvesting, you're removing organic matter and nutrients. And of course, when you're tilling, uh, which in organic systems, you mostly need to do some tillage, um, that is costing you some organic matter. So the next step is to test the soil. And a soil test is a double-edged sword. I would never tell an organic farmer not to test their soil, but I would also caution them not to interpret it too literally because a soil test, it's a snapshot um, of the 
chemical condition of the soil at one point in time, and it's actually quite dynamic, uh, which is, and it's especially so for nitrogen, so that uh, standard soil tests don't report nitrogen. What they will give you is the pH or the acidity, and that's pretty important to take note of because when it gets out of balance, then certain nutrients become hard for plants to pick up, and that's when you need lime, or in the case of an alkaline soil, you might need a sulfur application. Uh, I'll give you a, an estimate of plant available phosphorus, potassium, calcium, magnesium, and some micronutrients. The best soil test will give you at least five, which be uh, boron, manganese, copper, zinc, iron, um, those five. But uh, it'll depend upon the region, uh, what, which nutrients tend to be most often uh, critically short. A good soil test will give you a, a, a percentage total soil organic matter. And also will tell you what the cation exchange capacity, the capacity to hold those positively charged nutrients. You can get additional tests, uh, nitrate nitrogen. If you take it at a certain time of year, it can provide useful information as to how much uh, plant available nitrogen is there. And there are newer tests that in vary, through various means estimate potentially mineralizable organic nitrogen. It's telling you not only a snapshot of the nitrate present right now, but how much nitrate and ammonia in the plant might be able to obtain over the course of the season. Uh, there's a new test for active soil organic matter, uh, which uh, is a pretty good indication of soil microbial activity as a soil microbial respiration. These are some new soil health tests. So the next step is you look at the soil test, you say, okay, what, what nutrients do we actually need? And uh, to be perfectly honest, the more, I, the more research I look at more in, from recent years of soil, life dynamics, soil nutrient cycling, the more conservative I tend to become in recommending inputs. Because very often, if you improve the soil health by improving your rotation and the cover cropping and uh, easing up on the tillage when practical, uh, very often you will not need as much um, applied nutrients as suggested on the soil test. But you do use, and, um, organic and natural mineral uh, amendments, such as the ones we're seeing at the right here. There's blood meal, this is a thorbin kelp, uh, which is mostly micronutrients. There's potassium sulfate, which is a natural mineral uh, that can be used if your potassium is really short. Uh, kelp meal, borax, that's for the boron deficiency, and this is a liquid uh, fish fertilizer, um, NPK. Um, you will need some inputs, perhaps to restore really depleted soils and to remedy specific deficiencies. Um, and of course, adjusting the soil pH is pretty standard. If, you, if you're below about 5.5 uh, or to 6.0, you want some lime. Um, and you want to put on enough to sustain crop yields. Uh, some crops, you will simply have to add some fairly fast release organic nitrogen, like blood meal or feather meal, to really get a, um, a, an economically viable yield. And you also want to replenish nutrients removed in harvest. You don't want to be just taking nutrients off and, and not replenish them at all. We'll I'll, I'll talk about a few challenges that organic farmers encounter in nutrient management. One is, how do you translate a soil test to organic? And these are the recommendations that I was talking about before. The lime uh, nitrogen is based on the crop only. So it's a flat number. I mean, you could send 12 different soils in and if you put tomatoes your crop, they'll all come back saying 100 pounds per acre or whatever, something in that range. Phosphorus and potassium are based on the soil test, phosphorus and potassium, and again, the crop grown. Here's some challenges that organic uh, farmers face. One is that um, because it's biologically based, nutrient cycling in organically managed soils is more complex than is assumed to be the case uh, in standard soil test recommendations. Also, the type of amendments you use are variable in their NPK contents and in how soluble they are. And there's been a lack of research. Oh, this is beginning to be remedied thanks to the Organic Research and Extension Initiative uh, and strong interest on the part of NRCS in organic and sustainable systems um, and the Organic Transitions Program. But there's been historically a lack of research on nutrient management in organically managed soils. Well, here's an example of how that might affect um, the soil test and your actual uh, fertilizer need. Uh, this is the amount of nutrient applied. This is the yield. This is a response curve. And the arrow is an estimate of, of the, the economic sweet spot. At this point, 
the additional fertilizer is costing more than you're gonna add to your profit at market. So you don't wanna put on more than that for both an economic and ecological reasons. Um, if your soil test is low, typically you would expect a, law or a large response over a long range of nutrient levels and a fairly high um, appropriate uh, you know, rate to apply to get your optimum yield. But you can have a soil that tests low on that same nutrient, but if its biological activity is good, the crop may only need a little bit of assistance to get uh, to its optimum yield. And of course, at a high soil test, there'll be little or no response to added nutrient. In fact, the definition of a high on a soil test is no expected response, nutrient levels are already optimal. The next challenge is nitrogen. Nitrogen is the most difficult nutrient for any farmer to manage, but especially so for organic crops for a number of reasons. Um, if, if your soil, you're starting with a soil that has not yet been built up in terms of its overall health and fertility, if the soil life itself is depleted and out of balance, nitrogen will not be easily getting to your crop. And this will often happen when the field is newly transitioned to organic. Another thing that can happen, and this is a pitfall for some beginning organic gardeners and farmers, is you're tilling in a lot of organic matter and feeding the soil, but if there are nitrogen poor residues like straw or tree leaves, you're gonna tie up nitrogen for a while. Doesn't mean you lose, lose it forever. In fact, you've, you've locked it up, but and it'll, but it'll be a while before you can get to it. Another thing that happens is if you plant a heavy feeding crop like broccoli or, or uh, cabbage or lettuce or spinach in the early spring when the soil is still cool, even a very healthy soil will release nitrogen rather slowly and you will not get sufficient nitrogen to that quick maturing spring, like it's an early broccoli plant in the spring. Um, here the nitrogen deficiency was exaggerated by the fact that we uh, had basically uh, roll crimped a rye cover crop and planted this no-till. So that's an example of this, it wasn't tilled in, but it's still, uh, the root mass is still tying up nitrogen. You can have a situation where excessive rains have leached out the soil nitrogen. You could have a very healthy soil and you plant your lettuce and there's a terrific downpour and, and lots leached out. That's another thing that can happen. If your soil is cold or dry, that'll slow this biological turnover. And here's the other one that I'm really interested in seeing this addressed and I'm, it is being to be addressed. Today's crop cultivars were developed in and for high input conventional systems. And there's even some evidence that as a result of the selection in heavily fertilized fields year after year, they yield great in those circumstances, but they have partially lost the ability to partner with soil microbes such as mycorrhizal fungi and nitrogen fixing bacteria um, and nitrogen cycling bacteria, ones that turn organic nitrogen into plant available nitrogen right in the root zone. These new cultivars have lost some of their ability to associate with those highly beneficial organisms. So you try to grow them in an organic system and you take the feed the soil strategy and uh, the crop suffers. So there's some potential trade-offs in nitrogen and soil health. Um, here's an example of a roll crimped cover crop uh, of pearl millet. Uh, organic no-till, we grow a massive cover crop and then you uh, terminate the cover crop with little or no soil disturbance is excellent for soil health, but it can slow the rate at which nitrogen is mineralized and released to the next crop. And um, the, the, the typical response, if you wanna stay in business, you gotta provide the nitrogen. Now you can provide it in concentrated forms such as poultry litter or blood meal. Um, organic standards allow you to use a little bit of uh, Chilean sodium nitrate. But when you use a concentrated nitrogen in whatever form, it will leach nitrate to the groundwater. Uh, you'll have some risk of that. You'll have risk of increased nitrous oxide emissions, which is a potent greenhouse gas. And it has been found that when you keep, hot, you keep the soil nitrogen levels high, it accelerates the decomposition of organic matter. And as I mentioned before, the high levels of nutrients themselves also deter the plant root um, uh, microbe uh, partnership. So nitrogen is challenging for all farmers. This is what happens. You know, this is on a conventional farm. Let's say it's a well-managed conventional farm. They're using manure nitrogen. They're using manure for nitrogen. They're using a little bit of soluble nitrogen to make up the deficit according to the soil test. You got the soil life working on this. Uh, there's organic uh, nitrogen and active organic matter. Uh, all of this is being, all of this gets converted into ammonium and then nitrate um, by the soil life, regardless of the source. 
And if it rains, some is going to leach. If the soil is saturated for a period of time, some of it's going to denitrify. Uh, that's just the way it is. And especially when the soil life is depleted, when this link is weak and this reserve is small, and the farmer then has to use a little more soluble nitrogen, uh, the leaching and the denitrification do tend to intensify in the, when the soil health is below par. Another challenge that organic farmers uh, often face is matching the nitrogen release to um, the crop need. Like here's what the crop will consume. Typical crop will for first few weeks hardly use any because it's very small. And then it's growing like crazy and it's using a lot. And then later in the season, when it shifts to just moving uh, nutrients already in the plant over into the edible portion, be it a broccoli head or, or uh, the seed in a corn crop or wheat crop or whatever, then its nitrogen demand from the soil tails off. So your ideal amendment looks like this. It'll start releasing nitrogen just as the plant needs it, peaks when the plant's need is at its peak, and then it's done releasing nitrogen um, as the crop matures. And if it releases it too fast, and this can happen in organic systems, you put a fast release organic fertilizer on a, a slow starting crop like strawberry, that's all gonna come out and, and leach before the crop can use it. That was even true of strawberry planted in rotation after broccoli. The broccoli residues had about 100 plus pounds of nitrogen, but it all came out and leached away before the strawberry used it. Or you can have release that's too slow. If you have a very slow release source, or your soil life is below par and it's not really working on your organic amendment very well. The crop needs it, it kind of goes hungry, doesn't give you a good yield, and then right at the end of the season, there's free nitrogen and it leaches away too. Lots of challenges with this nutrient. So what if we could deliver the nitrogen right where it's needed, where you have all these good slow release nitrogen sources, you know, these are organic inputs, uh, cover crops, whatever, okay? So we got them releasing the ammonium and nitrate as usual. Uh, you have them, the soil life bringing it mostly into the organic, uh, active organic matter. And what if it could be released right in the root zone? Like the only place you have a whole lot of nitrate and ammonium is right where the plants need it. Uh, and of course, if you have a nitrogen fixer in your, in your crop rotation, it'll take it right out of the atmosphere. Uh, but this is called tightly coupled nutrient cycling or tightly coupled nitrogen cycling. And in fact, the good news is some evidence that this can occur. We'll talk about that a little bit more later. So another management challenge um, is phosphorus. Uh, crops use about five to eight pounds of nitrogen for every pound of phosphorus. And typically a good vegetable harvest will only take about 10 pounds of elementals phosphorus or 23 pounds of phosphate, P2O5, off the land per acre. Uh, whereas the same harvest can take as much as 50 to 100 pounds each of potassium and nitrogen. So the manure and compost provide these elements in a ratio of about two or three to one. So if you use manure and compost to meet all of your nitrogen needs, uh, you will end up with uh, excessive soil phosphorus, which uh, can be released to the uh, surface waters and runoff, uh, will inhibit your uh, mycorrhizal fungi and it can tie up micronutrients, particularly zinc. So here's another challenge, high tunnels. Especially in the humid zone uh, where farmers are used to more rainfall than evaporation and there's a net downward leaching of, of uh, salts in the soil, you don't have salt accumulation and they put up a high tunnel, you've created a semi-arid environment. You've cut off the rain, you're only putting on enough moisture through drip irrigation to maintain your crop. Uh, they're great for year-round production. Uh, and very often it's intensively uh, multi-cropped. Uh, what will tend to happen is you deplete the nitrogen and potassium, and then when you try to make up for it with a lot of compost, you'll build up the phosphorus uh, beyond the desirable levels. Um, intensive production, especially if you're tilling after each crop, you're gonna burn up the organic matter. The higher temperatures and longer growing season further accelerate that loss. And if you're not growing cover crops, and it is hard to grow, uh, justify growing cover crops um, in such high value real estate, although more and more um, uh, professional um, service providers are recommending it because it really is important for balancing and, and maintaining soil health. But you have a reduced residue return 
And the other thing you can do that can happen with large inputs of organic uh, fertilizers and compost is you actually build up salts in the tunnel, in the high tunnel. And that can occur anyway, just from the nature of the, of the uh, soil ecosystem there. So let's look at some goals of organic nutrient management. Basically, you want abundant crops and clean water. And you know, maintaining uh, the yields and quality. And you wanna build the soil capacity to meet the crop needs with minimal input. The healthier your soil, the more the crops can get what they need from the soil and the less you'll need to add. And of course, you wanna remedy the deficiencies and imbalances I mentioned and um, replenish what you take off. And if you do have an excess, you wanna draw it down if possible. And if you have an excess of potassium, it's pretty easy to draw that down because you just don't add any and you're harvesting off 50, 100 pounds per acre every year and it'll come down. Phosphorus is more challenging because you're only taking off a small amount every year. So you really wanna avoid those excesses, especially in phosphorus. So how do you, uh, replenishing nutrients. Uh, if you look at vegetable crops, these are some estimates. Um, and I wanted to mention there are some field, there are some lecture notes that go this, that go into greater depth and provide the resources and the references from which a lot of this information is derived. And uh, there seems to be a formatting problem here. This is nitrogen, this is phosphorus. Oh, excuse me, let's go back. This is nitrogen, uh, phosphorus, and potassium. Uh, I'm not sure what happened to the formatting there, but uh, in any case, um, these are some crops with typical yields. This is uh, based on some uh, a publication by uh, Michelle Wander that's on e-organic. Uh, uh, it's, it's an article was written a number of years ago. And these are the typical nutrients removed. Now I, I did, I left, uh, put a range for nitrogen. It was a very low ball estimate in the article that I mentioned. But then when I looked up the nutritional value of the edible portion and, and calculated back, I got somewhat higher figures, but still, we're looking at um, much lower amounts of nitrogen that are typically recommended in a soil test. I mean, how often do you have, say you're gonna grow onions or broccoli and they tell you to put on only 50 pounds per acre, that's rare. But look at how little phosphorus is removed. And then um, here's the potassium removals, which some are, sometimes are kind of higher. And you'll see uh, recommended rates. And this is for phosphorus and potassium on a high soil test or which is optimal. So we've got a situation where uh, here's broccoli, a good broccoli crop will take 50 pounds and they're having 175 pounds. It's gonna take seven pounds of phosphorus and they're uh, recommending 22 and even in, in some, uh, some crops as much as 44 pounds. And that's on a test that says high, which means optimal. So we have to wonder what's going on here. Now, one thing to look at, if you're an organic farmer and using mixed compost that's fairly rich, it's got some manure in the starting mix, typically it's about a one, one, one analysis. So when you put that down, you're gonna give, you're gonna uh, five tons per acre. And that's a very light rate. You put five tons per acre of compost broadcast, you could just barely see it on the field. It's a little thin fairy dust layer. Um, but you're adding a hundred pounds of nitrogen. Um, and you're adding 44 pounds of phosphorus, about fourfold what you need for most of those crops or more, and then 83 pounds of potassium. So these two, uh, that's a little higher than the removal. That's about the range. So, uh, and then poultry litter, this is a common fertilizer, uh, 543 is a, a, a use it anywhere from a thousand pounds to one ton per acre, and you get a similar emphasis of overloading of phosphorus. Okay. So look at field crops. Um, again, I'm, I apologize for these. Uh, um, I'm not sure what's happening with the formatting here, but I've created the uh, PowerPoint presentation that was below this uh, uh, last line, not overlapping it. Anyway, these are estimates from some Virginia Tech uh, uh, bulletins, extension bulletins I, I've seen. Uh, these field crops do tend to remove more nitrogen and uh, especially grass hay or corn silage, uh, remove a lot of potassium. And then again, you can look at the comparison. If you put on these materials, uh, you will not be replenishing the nitrogen, which is not a big problem if you have legumes in your rotation, you're fixing a lot of it. And if you have healthy soil, even non-legumes are fixing some in their root zone. Uh, potassium, uh, you have plenty, you're, you're, you're um, exceeding the replacement for your grains, but the forages consume a huge amount of potassium in the harvest. And again, the phosphorus, uh, these crops do remove more phosphorus, but not quite as much as being applied. 
Okay, so this is some interesting research that was done by Dr. Robin Klute, uh, presented uh, once at an Organic Agriculture Research Symposium in 2017. I also heard him give the same uh, results on a, um, an NRCS webinar. Um, and he did these studies on Southeast Coastal Plain sandy soils. These are not known for the high fertility. This was not an Iowa mollusol by a long shot. He did a corn, soybean, wheat rotation with winter cover crops, managed them organically, got a soil test, and he either applied the recommended phosphorus and potassium from NOP uh, allowed uh, materials or did not apply any at all. Uh, Nitrogen was applied at half of the rate recommended by the soil test. The results were, uh, after several years, those cover crops allowed that rotation to build soil organic matter significantly, which is a real accomplishment on these soils. You get that to go up from 1.2 to 1.7 like he did, that's a substantial gain. The grain yields were 100% whether or not the phosphorus potassium were added and 50% of the recommended end was sufficient. Furthermore, even though he was harvesting off phosphorus and potassium with those grains, at the end of five or six years, there was hardly any change in the soil test phosphorus or potassium. And he points out several things about these standard soil tests and recommendations. One is they only measure the top six inches of the soil. And as I mentioned earlier, soil biology is ignored and there's an assumption that the soil is kind of leaky and it does overlook the nutrient recovery by these deep rooted cover crops. And he summed it up. He said, living soil changes everything. So this is an interesting challenge, broccoli. Uh, I think this is a plant breeding need. Broccoli grown organically or conventionally needs huge amounts of nitrogen. Uh, in, now this level, uh, 220 pounds per acre, that's for optimum yield. That's an economic optimum. That's not the absolute maxed out level, but that's the level up to which it really paid the farmer. In fact, um, in trials in Oregon and California, the increase in yield with increasing nitrogen was repaying several dollars on up to $30 for every dollar spent on feather meal nitrogen. Now, feather meal is not the cheapest fertilizer out there. It's not like ammonium nitrates. Now, here's this uh, tight nitrogen cycling that I mentioned that earlier. What if you have those, those uh, good organisms delivering the desired nutrients right in the root zone? Uh, there was an interesting study, UC Santa Cruz, they, look, they, they looked at organic tomato fields. They, were, they found three uh, nutrient cycling patterns. One is nitrogen deficient. The organic farmer was not providing enough soluble nitrogen. The uh, soil life and the soil organic matter were on the low side. Uh, so there was not, not, not much soluble nitrogen and, and kind of low yield. It wasn't extremely low, but it was definitely nitrogen limited. And nitrogen saturated, you had high soluble nitrogen maintained by higher inputs of fairly concentrated organic fertilizers like guano and, and uh, uh, poultry litter and Chilean nitrate, and a high risk of uh, leaching, even though you also had the high yield. And the third set of fields, there were four fields that had tight nitrogen cycling. The primary amendment was a compost that was made of a wide diversity of materials and had a moderate C to N ratio, about 18, 20 to one, maybe 15 to one, something in that range. And this material released nitrogen very slowly and it supported a high level of soil biological activity. And the, soil, the nitrogen in the bulk soil, the soluble nitrogen was as low as it was up here, but the yield was as high as it was here. And both of these circumstances had very high levels of biological activity, but here the organisms that were present were those that, were, that helped plants to obtain nitrogen right in the root zone. And Whereas here, the, or, the soil life was more dominated by organisms that tended to consume a lot of organic matter. So the organic matter was a little lower there. So, and uh, one of the things that these researchers found is that there were plant root enzymes that were under genetic control that were important in, part, in this partnership. That those plant root enzymes worked with the organisms to release and uh, absorb the nitrogen, right? Okay. So one thing you want to do is to adjust the amendment rates uh, to soil test phosphorus levels. If your soil is low in phosphorus and it's also low in organic matter, sure, build it up some of the, with compost. Because compost works in a complementary fashion with your cover crops to build soil health and fertility. 
But once that soil phosphorus gets to awesome, you only want to put on enough compost to maintain it. And if you're harvesting one crop a year, you're adding 10 pounds of phosphorus per acre per year. It's not very much compost. And then you want to grow legumes for, for the rest of the nitrogen. And if your soil is very high in phosphorus, you want to really cut way back on, on the uh, compost, uh, if you use it at all. Uh, and in general, little compost goes a long way. For example, a single heavy application on a, a grain farm in Utah, uh, and this is about, oh, about 20 tons per acre of, um, of a good manure compost put on once, increased soil organic matter and wheat yields almost doubled both of those for 15 years. And it worked in conjunction with, with the cover crops and the crop residues. So um, you don't need a whole lot to get what you want uh, out of your compost. Cover crops are a vital tool for organic nutrient management um, because they, um, they feed the soil life and build soil organic matter. As I said, that the, the uh, staple of, in the diet of the soil life is the, um, is the uh, living plant. And the legumes fix nitrogen. And all of the cover crops help absorb, retain, and recycle the soluble nitrogen. And a lot of them retrieve nutrients from the subsoil, deep-rooted cover crops like uh, pearl millet is a uh, roost down to five feet. So it'll, it'll pick that up and uh, tillage radish similarly and, and even rye is pretty good at that. Um, you enhance plant available soil phosphorus, especially the legumes and the buckwheat really help pick up soil phosphorus and potassium. The grasses are really good at unlocking mineral potassium. And yet if your P and K are already optimal, these cover crops are not gonna aggravate, are not gonna create or aggravate an excess because uh, they don't fix it out of thin air like they do nitrogen and carbon. So you wanna mix and match your cover crops to mat, uh, for, for nitrogen and other goals. Legumes will fix the nitrogen, of course, recover. They can recover nitrogen some. Uh, they, they have a low carbon to nitrogen ratio, and so they're, they rapidly release uh, nitrogen. And if you have an all legume cover crop, you can have a significant uh, risk of leaching and uh, uh, denitrification to nitrous oxide. Crucifers like uh, radish, um, if you have, um, they do not fix nitrogen, uh, but they have a tremendous ability to recover nitrogen, especially radish. It'll, it'll scrub the entire top five feet of the, of the soil profile of uh, soluble nitrogen. Because they are also succulent and low carbon to nitrogen, they'll release that nutrient back rapidly. And if it's not used quickly, you will have a, a leaching and a, a denitrification risk. Grasses at the opposite end, um, I say limited, not zero, because grasses such, especially as like something like pearl millet, um, in healthy soil, it will host nitrogen fixing bacteria in its root zone that can create uh, fix up to 40 pounds per acre of nitrogen. Land races of corn do this as well. And some of these, uh, some of those uh, land race corn nitrogen fixing capabilities have actually been successfully transferred into standard non-GMO uh, Midwest hybrids. So I, um, this is by a, um, a small private uh, nonprofit breeding um, organization called Mondaman Institute. And I, I think we're gonna see some really exciting breakthroughs there. So um, they've a high recovery ability uh, because their, net, their seed end ratio is high. There is some risk that they'll tie up nitrogen for your very next crop, but they're certainly not going to leach or, or create a, a nitrous oxide risk. Your mix is very often your sweet spot. Um, because the grass is demanding nitrogen, it maintains the high fixation potential of the legume component. You have a balanced carbon to nitrogen and a gradual release and um, fairly low risks of uh, pollutant, um, leaching or pollution. Another thing to look at is the age of the cover crop. When it's a seedling, you don't have much biomass, but the nitrogen is very concentrated. So you're, you're avail you, if you terminate really early, you're not going to get much benefit of any kind. Um, and the older the cover crop, the higher the carbon to nitrogen ratio. Um, if you let it get into the vegetative stage and turn it under when it's got a moderate biomass, you don't get that much uh, organic matter back, so you don't have quite as large a soil health benefit, but you get a big burst of nitrogen for your next crop. At the flowering stage, 
Uh, you have very little quick nitrogen. You may have not as much quick nitrogen, but if you have a long season crop, you have a slow release of nitrogen. And this is really the point at which your soil health benefits are your greatest because it's like a balanced diet, again, for the soil life. A really over mature cover crop, you may not get quite as much um, benefits, but you do get your maximum biomass. So I just want to quickly point out that managing the soil organic matter seems to be a, a trade-off, but it's really a balancing act because um, you have two key processes here that the soil life uh, performs based on all these organic inputs and living plants growing in the soil. You have mineralization. That releases both carbon and nitrogen from soil organic matter for short-term crop uptake. And yes, that does come off as respiration of CO2. So a biologically active soil will appear to be venting more carbon dioxide to the atmosphere than a kind of uh, less active or, or dead soil. Yet, even the, at the same time, the other, series, the other important function is sequestering the carbon and the nitrogen for long-term maintenance of the soil quality. And the good news is that these tend to increase together when you use a, a, take an integrated approach to building soil organic matter and soil health uh, and nutrient management, that those two uh, key functions will often increase together. Here is another trick where you can, you, can you, you look at your field and say, okay, we got a young crop like this. You say, okay, where do you want the nitrogen? Now, in this case, it's, it's soybean, but let's pretend that's actually cabbage, okay? Because I want a heavy feeder in this example. You want nitrogen released right in the row. You want the soil warm enough so that it's going to mineralize nitrogen. You don't want a lot of weeds right there competing with your crop. So what if we just till right there? The tillage, either strip tillage or ridge tillage, concentrates the benefits of tillage and also the drawbacks, the soil disturbance or breakdown of organic matter right in the crop row. And meanwhile, you have no till here. You're not, just, you're not stimulating weed seeds to come up. You're not stimulating the soil life to burn up organic matter. You're feeding it all this residue. And this general concept, and one researcher, um, the reference again is in the, in the, um, uh, the, the notes that go with this presentation, calls it soil functional zone management. And basically it's saying, well, we need to disturb the soil to manage weeds and manage nutrients and release them to the crop, but we also don't want to disturb the soil too much because we want to build soil organic matter. So you have both functions going on together. Um, so another way to do this is to apply your fertilizer in a band. I talked to uh, one of the researchers, Doug Collins, who did the study in Oregon on broccoli. And I said, well, did you band that 200 pounds a night, which said, no, we actually did broadcast it. And if we banded it, it might well have been more efficient. Uh, another way is you put drip irrigation right down this row and fertigate right through the drip. Zone planting. This is something uh, one of my, uh, that uh, Dr. Ron Morris at Virginia Tech, who worked with organic no-till vegetable systems, he came up with this idea of you plant the legume on the bed top where you want a lot of nitrogen released. And then you plant something like sorghum sudan that's just going to hold the soil and bind up nutrients and suppress weeds in the alley. And you go through, you mow all this down, either maybe shallow till that or no till crimp it. Uh, this gets packed down by the tractor wheels, uh, knocked down by the tractor wheels, and you have all of your um, succulent legume releasing nitrogen right in the crop row where you need it. So just a summary of best organic nutrient management practices. You want to build and maintain your healthy soil and grow cover crops. That's going to create the foundation. The more your soil can provide for the crop, the less you're going to have to add. And in fact, um, all you're going to need to do is replenish what you take off. And there's even some evidence that you may not have to fully replenish the potassium because there's such huge reserves of mineral potassium in the soil that as the soil is gradually weathered from the rocks, that's gradually brought into circulation. Uh, and uh, there was a study that showed there was very little response to added potassium on a wide range of uh, studies. So that's very interesting uh, to look into. Perennial sod crops will help restore soil fertility. Um, do test your soil and test your organic amendments so you know what you're adding. Uh, definitely interpret your soil test through the lens of uh, soil as a living system. Uh, remember not take it too literally. Um, it's only a snapshot. 
yet it can provide useful red flags for you if something's getting very depleted or way out of balance. Uh, crop foliar analyses will supplement soil analyses. That's a very important tool that I didn't mention earlier. Um, and also be sure to adjust your manure and compost inputs according to soil phosphorus. It's so easy to overshoot on phosphorus in organic systems. And it's relatively easy to get a lot of your nitrogen from the air with your legume cover crops and even some of your uh, more vigorous grass crops that will, will host free living nitrogen fixers right in their root zone. You won't have to add as much nitrogen as your soil test recommends. And again, the potassium, these recent studies uh, of it, I think it was University of Illinois, they've reviewed a whole bunch of different studies and came to the conclusion that we don't need nearly as much as we used to think. So, um, and there are organic nutrient budgeting tools that are very handy. And here's another thing that I would always say, um, when in doubt, do a side-by-side -side trial. It is so helpful if you're looking at, uh, well, gee, do I need more nitrogen? Now, this is what they did on those broccoli trials. And yes, the sweet spot was indeed 220 pounds per acre, but there've been some other studies corn grown in a rotation with high, high biomass diverse cover crops. There are a number of corn growers, uh, organic or even non-organic, who are, who are using conservation agriculture. They found they could almost zero out their, their fertilizer inputs without any change in the yield. And then again, I mentioned the zone management. Uh, and let's see, is this the... Okay. Um, I didn't get to cover nearly all of what could be uh, discussed here. There is one of these soil health and organic farming guides that's on uh, nutrients. There's others on tillage and weeds, which I touched on at times. Uh, they're all available at www.ofrf.org. And I want to thank Organic Farming Research Foundation for giving me the, the opportunity and the honor to help them develop the guides and give these webinars. And I think we're up to question. Oh, here's here are the other... Uh, here are the other organ great organizations that made this possible, uh, Organic Valley, Cliff Bar, General Mills, Danone, One Planet, One Health, uh, National Co-op Grocers, and Whole Foods, and uh, all these other organizations. Clarence Heller Foundation, of course, is uh, one that funded this series of webinars. I want to thank them especially. Um, and I think that is it. Okay, thank you, Mark. Um, I just wanted to put back the slide with the um, link to the soil health guide, just so that mm. people have that link and they are able to download those. Um, they cover all the different topics um, that have been part of this webinar series. And I had put a link in the chat box to where you can find all the recordings from this series, as well as the slide handout and presentation notes from this webinar. And we will be archiving this webinar there as well. So we're gonna move on to our Q&A for the next 25 minutes or so. And if you have a question, I know many people have questions already, um, you can type them into the Q&A box on your screen and we'll be reading them out loud until we run out of time. Um, there's also a chat box where you have the option of putting in a comment to all the panelists and then you can have this little drop down there and you can comment to all the attendees as well. I know a couple people figured that out there. So um, I just wanted to let you know about that. So um, moving on to the questions here. Here. We have quite a few. Um, okay, this person, you kind of touched on this um, when you were talking about the challenges of using soil tests in um, for organic production and interpreting them. Um, this person is certified organic and each year she has soil tests done which tests for available NPK and she amends the soil with slow acting NP and K but how does she know how much to add since she's guessing that there's a large amount of available P and K in particular, that's not showing up as available? Uh, that is a good question. I would recommend perhaps doing some side-by-side -side trials. Do you really need to apply what you're applying and to spend money on it? One thing I forgot to point out, and that is that um, although I said a lot of soil test labs are still using the 20th century paradigm, um, Pacific Northwest and Oregon State Extension Services have really revised their whole approach. They're taking full account of all the sources of nitrogen, including soil organic matter, soil life, cover crops, manure, even irrigation water nitrate concentrations, and they've cut way back. They, they adjust their nitrogen recommendations based on all those factors. 
and they now recommend zero P and K if your soil test is already high. Only when it drops to medium, which is suboptimal, that they start recommending P and K. And it was based on some of the same information that I showed you about uh, replacement rates, et cetera. So that's exciting to see, and I think we're gonna see more and more of that in the, in the, uh, in the near future. And it's easy in organic systems to say, okay, well, it's slow release, we better put on more. And that can be a pitfall, especially with the phosphorus. So I would recommend um, really thinking about it from the viewpoint of, well, how much can we get just from the soil cycling itself? Uh, and then just try a side-by-side -side trial. And the more living uh, plants and more diversity you have in your rotation, uh, the less you'll find you need to add. On the other hand, and it can be very crop specific, you may find that your broccoli does need a lot of some of those amendments. And then uh, when it comes time for, let's say the, the uh, cucurbit crops, they may be not need very much at all. Uh, so it's really observational. Uh, I think we're really, really just learning a lot about uh, nutrient dynamics and living soils. Okay, um, early in the presentation, you mentioned um, the chemical hard pan. Um, could you um, review what you said on how to release aluminum from the soil or otherwise negate its impact on plants? Um, basically, I would say uh, one, of the, one of the strategies that's been recommended is to get some soluble calcium down into the soil profile, although one thing I learned recently is that there's some cover crops, notably pearl millet. Pearl millet can grow its roots six feet down regardless of either physical or what I call chemical hard pan. It grows into acid high aluminum soils. There are a number of cover crops that do this. So, and what you're doing is you're bringing the organic activity down the soil profile. Uh, I would go with a um, if you if you know if you verify a pH below five and a half in the subsoil and you know that your roots aren't getting down there and it isn't particularly a physical hard pan, you might try a little gypsum or um, if your soil is um, acidic at the top too, I would go with high calcium limestone. Um, uh, but I would say that this is something that can be remedied. And the more I've read uh, about cover crops and just maximizing the, the uh, root, the living root, maximizing the living root is uh, one of the NRCS principles of soil health. And I think that it's exceedingly valuable. It may actually help with this situation. Uh, but yeah, I think, I think that uh, getting uh, the, the, uh, the available calcium will help to push that aluminum out of solution. It's a, it's a uh, fairly low impact uh, chemical approach to it, uh, chemical in the broad sense of the, of the term. Okay, um, let's see, this person um, said that, you had said that we needed to replenish nutrients that are removed during harvest. If you have enough biological activity in the soil, is there enough soil parent materials in the soil that the biological life can solubilize and provide all of the nutrients needed by the cash crop? Um, he, is, he believes that Dr. Elaine Ingram said that there's enough of the basic parent materials in the soil to provide all the nutrients needed for the next 10,000 years. Do you agree with this? Um, well, that is something that I, uh, I, I kind of, I like the idea of replacement because even if it seems to be an infinite resource, you're eventually mining it out. Like when, when, uh, when Europeans started first breaking the prairie, the organic matter seemed infinite. Uh, now it's true, on the other hand, uh, I do agree that there are extremely large reserves, particularly of potassium and probably of the micronutrients. Uh, the phosphorus, as I said, you don't need as much as we tend to be using and the nitrogen can be fixed. Um, I would probably lean towards just watching the soil tests and uh, you'll see a downward trend if you're beginning to draw down the reserves. Uh, so I'm not sure where I would come down on that. that, that that's a good question. I mean, that's one that, that's one that uh, uh, Dr. Clute is, is uh, uh, grappling with too. Like, is it, is it ethical to mine? Is, is, it, is it really sustainable to mine these soils forever, even if they're able to give and give and give? And I would say if we could figure out what the natural weathering rate is under a well-managed healthy soil, and figure out how many pounds of potassium that's providing, that'll give us a guideline as to how much we might want to still replenish. Uh, 
Uh, and that's a good question, but uh, I do, um, there is an extreme version of feed the soil and soil feed the plant, which is like, don't even bother adding more nutrients. You don't need them. It can be uh, provided forever. And especially when your soil health is not up to par, uh, that often does run into a nutrient deficient situation. And, you know, it can really cost you some yield. Uh, but it's really, it's so site specific and it's so much uh, more observational than something that I could uh, answer definitively sitting here and uh, at this webinar. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Um, you mentioned that large annual compost additions can result in too much phosphorus added to the soil. What is a large addition? Depends upon your compost phosphorus level and your soil phosphorus level. So Compost that's moderately rich might test 111, you know, it's like a manure compost. 111 would have in a 10 ton application, uh, that would be 44 pounds of elemental phosphorus. And remember, you've probably harvested off 10 pounds of phosphorus in a good vegetable crop, maybe 20 pounds if you've double cropped and it was high yielding. Uh, you might have harvested off 25 pounds if you had a good yield of corn or wheat or soybeans. Uh, or garlic. It turns out garlic takes a little bit more phosphorus than most vegetables. But okay, so that's that's what you're looking at. Um, another thing you can do is you can go with a compost that's mostly plant-based. I've seen compost test as little as 0.2% phosphate. So that would mean instead of adding 44 pounds in that ten in that five-ton application, you're only adding eight pounds, which um, is what you would expect to harvest off. And again, you have to look at your soil tests. If your soil tests are in the low to medium range, um, it's probably okay to add a little more than you're taking off. But remember that your mycorrhizal activity will start to, to taper off once you get beyond the optimum, which is what's called high. If you get into the very high range, you'll shut them down. So look at the soil tests and look at your compost analysis, I would say. Um, and if you want to be able to add more compost without getting your phosphorus too high, look at mostly plant-based materials. Okay, um, let's see. Um, you mentioned a test for active soil organic matter. Can you point us in that direction? Uh, Cornell University has something called the Cornell Assessment of Soil Health. And one of the elements is uh, a permanganate oxidizable carbon, POXC. Um, I'm trying to think there probably are certain labs that will, will offer that. And there's another one uh, that's a particulate organic matter. These are different ways to get an approximate handle on the active organic matter. Um, now we're kind of in the, we're kind of at the ground floor at the beginning phases of this new technology of soil health and active organic matter and soil biological activity. Uh, the NRCS actually just had a comment period on a draft technical note for their staff describing uh, what appear to be the best soil health uh, measurements and lab procedures. One of these is the permanganate oxidizable carbon. Uh, there is a kit that it can be done in the field. Uh, I'm not sure how widely available it is and how accurate it is, but uh, it is something that's been a number of labs. I know Dr. Ray Weil and, and uh, colleagues up in uh, University of Maryland have been working on this for a number of years. Uh, but that is the most promising one for active uh, soil organic matter. Okay, and also, um, can you point us in the direction of organic nutrient budgeting tools? Uh, yeah, I would say um, uh, look at the guides. Uh, there are some in the one on nutrients, and there's a new guide on soil health and risk management. There's a couple of uh, nutrient budgeting tools there. Uh, I don't really have that information right in front of me right now. Uh, there are a number of links. Uh, I believe there's some that are available right on eOrganic. Um, yeah, I can look for those um, during the next question because um, there are, if you go to extension.org slash organic underscore production, um, we have some articles on nutrient management there as well. Yeah. Um, and then the soil health guides, um, the link is right on the screen there and those are free to download from the Organic Farming Research Foundation. Mm -hmm. Okay, so um, can you comment on organic matter in the soil and what percentage is desirable? Ah, that is the most site-specific question yet. <laughs> okay. 
if you're in Florida and you're on a loamy sand, if you're at 1.5%, you're doing damn good. If you're in Iowa on one of their, one of their prairie soils and you're at 1.5%, you're in terrible shape. The warmer the climate, the faster organic matter burns up and the lower the steady state organic matter in a healthy, well-managed soil. Um, and the sandier the soil, also the lower the organic matter. Because some of this, uh, the major part of the stable organic matter is, is adsorbed to silt and clay particles. So if you're on a loam, a silt loam, a clay loam, they'll all be fairly rich in silt and clay and you will have a pretty substantial organic matter. So I would say uh, if you're in New England and you're on one of those forest soils, uh, you probably want at least five or six percent. If you're in the upper Midwest and you're in a cool temperate climate on one of the, um, um, the prairie soils, the mollusols, at least five, if not six or eight uh, percent. In fact, uh, there was a story of some very depleted um, uh, this uh, farmer rancher, Gabe Brown, I believe he had wrote a whole book. It's called From Dirt to Soil. And by going from uh, very poorly managed uh, wheat uh, fallow crop rotation to uh, management intensive rotational grazing uh, with a few forage crops here and there, that soil went from two to seven percent over, and it took a couple decades, but he built it back up from two percent, which is extremely depleted, up to seven percent. But I would say if you're on a sandy soil in a warm climate, uh, you know, a sandy loam, and you're in a pretty warm climate, and you're up at two percent, and you uh, you see good evidence of soil life and soil health, you're in pretty good shape. Uh, if you're on a medium textured soil in a temperate climate, four or five percent is probably good. If you're in a cool climate, and you're on one of these, so it was originally a prairie soil, you probably want to be get up around six or eight. Okay. Um, this person has met some people who argue that foliar application of solutions containing azobacter and other microbes together with micronized nutrients would enhance nutrient acquisition, for example, nitrogen. Do you have any comment or recommendations about the efficacy of this type of approach? I don't really know that much. In fact, um, there's one more guide that hasn't come out yet, and I'm still doing the background research on it. And that one of the questions is, is there any value to all of these inoculants? I would, my guess at this point is that the most likely to be effective inoculants are ones that you're applying specific organisms to the seed or the root of a crop, and it's organisms or uh, a diversity of organisms that you know will tend to associate with that crop and benefit it. I mean, the most obvious and well-known example is inoculating seeds for nitrogen fixation and legumes. Okay. So I don't know about foliar applications. I know that there is, you know, a leaf microbiome as well as a soil microbiome, and that's the basis for using compost teas um, to uh, ward off disease and improve overall crop health. Okay. Um, for organic walnut orchard nutrient management, would you recommend soil or foliar testing or both? Oh, yes. I, um, a, lot of, um, uh, a lot of fruit and nut tree growers do use foliar testing. For some reason, foliar testing is more widely used in perennial crops like vineyard and orchard and uh, berry crops than in annuals. I think it could be valuable in annuals as well. I would use both because the foliar test tells you what the plant is actually seeing. The soil test only tells you what the soil lab sees. Uh, and I think that this could also provide information in annual crops as well, but definitely it's fairly standard practice to use that, use both together. Because okay. if you, for instance, if you have a, a, a soil test that says, okay, everything's got, everything is plentiful and the plant isn't getting enough of certain nutrients, it could either mean that there is a deficiency in the soil microbiome or it could mean that the pH is such that it is making it hard for the plant to get that particular nutrient. So the two together will tell you more than either one alone. Okay, thanks. Um, let's see, you indicate that radishes being able to take up, um, that radishes are able to take up large quantities of nitrogen. Would a radish cover crop be useful in capturing residual nitrogen to mitigate leaching? Absolutely, it's, it's the best. The only thing is, 
the radish itself, when it, you know, if, if you grow it in the late summer and you have a freezing winter, uh, temperatures getting below 15 degrees Fahrenheit, the radish will die. And once it's dead, it will re-release those nutrients. So I would say to mop up nutrients and hold them, I would grow a mixture of radish and a winter cereal grain. Uh, you know, if you're growing into a winter that might kill the radish, I would have rye with it because the rye will then recycle anything that the radish loses back out. Now, if you're in a milder climate where the radish will grow or uh, mild enough that you could plant fairly soon after the radish is finished up, uh, then you will be able to utilize those nutrients. But yeah, I would tend to, uh, you know, if you really want to uh, uh, hold the nitrogen, I would combine the radish with a, with a more high carbon, like a, a cereal grain. Okay. Um, we had a question um, from someone who wants to know how she can apply this information to a small household organic garden. And she said um, she uses cover crops in her mid-sized garden, but um, some of her clients um, have very small gardens and don't use cover crop. Ah, uh, how to apply it to... That is a good question. Um... I know that I try to cover crop my garden. I'm not always successful in getting it to come up, uh, but um, if you're if the issue is how to manage the cover crop on a very 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 small scale, uh, get a sickle or a weed whacker and just cut it off at the surface. You can compost the tops. You can use it for mulching. Uh, the thing to remember, I mean, one of the things that very easily happens on very on, on small scale is to just rely on compost. You build up the compost. You really create a totally different microbiome and ecosystem there because your phosphorus goes, gets astronomical. And yes, the soil is rich and the crops get enough nutrients. Uh, I think more research needs to be done on the long-term effects on both soil quality and, and uh, uh, crop health and also produce quality. Uh, it may well be that you know, on these very small scales, it just makes sense to be more reliant on compost. But remember, you may not need, again, you may not need as much as you think. Okay. Um, let's see. Oh, cut grass or leaves, any thoughts? Um, as long as they're free of herbicides, uh, you have those mulches are, um, are a good thing on small gardens. I, I often use mulches and, um, Again, keep doing the soil tests and you know check the trends. I once built up too much potassium once from using grass hay mulch as, as you know my go-to weed control. <laughs> so. Um, okay, um, someone wanted you to repeat the anecdote about the twenty tons of compost working for fifteen years and what the yield impact was. I mean, I know you said the compost, it wasn't just compost that they put in and then didn't do anything else for 15 uh, years. Well, this said. was, uh, this was in a part of Utah. It was very dry and they had, uh, they're growing wheat. It was just a one, it was one experiment and I'm really not sure if the compost was the only variable. I think it was, uh, but the idea of it, now it is a very arid environment. It's probably about 10 inches of rain a year and the yields were low. So actually, even though the numbers in terms of uh, doubling soil organic matter and doubling wheat yields were spectacular. Uh, the actual increase in income from that wheat was actually not enough to pay for the, for the compost. It was a, I think it was a manure bedding compost. And I think it was like 20, something like 20 or 22 tons per acre. And that's dry weight. So it was a pretty heavy application. It was probably an inch deep or something like that. Uh, but what happens, what a number of studies have shown is that if you use a little compost, in conjunction with high biomass cover crops, you get more benefit than either practice alone. They're, they complement each other somehow. They have different effects on the soil life and the soil organic matter. Okay, um, let's see. I think we have time for one final question here and we have one more question in the queue, mm -hmm. kind of a general thoughts question. Uh, mining the soil resource is not a good practice. We need to be thinking of regenerative processes that keep all soil processes in harmony and sustainable. Any thoughts? Absolutely, I agree completely. I think the first, uh, one of the things we need to do is to get all the nutrients that come out of society, find a safe and ecologically sound way to get them back on the land. I mean, there's so many cases of super over concentration of nutrients, uh, all of the concentrated animal feeding operations, 
Think of all of the organic matter that goes to waste. People burn their leaves or they send them to the landfill, uh, food waste. There are ways to uh, return nutrients to the soil. Uh, the pitfall is where you think the more the better and you've got a little tiny patch of land in an urban farm or urban garden. You say, oh, the soil is in terrible shape. We've got to just load on the compost. And really, even in those circumstances, I say, you know, put on a half inch of compost um, and, you know, if your soil has low and everything, including fossils, you know, put in a half an inch, maybe an inch on, mix it in, and then just start growing cover crops. You really want to grow most of your fertility. Um, and we do want to return all of our wastes, you know, uh, you know, there's got to find a way even to get, you know, human waste back onto the land in a safe way that's not going to carry either heavy metals or uh, pathogens. Uh, there's no reason for any of these to go down, you know, go out to the sea or into the waters and, and, and pollute them. So, um, very good question. I, I think regenerative is the key, and the number one regenerator is the living plant. Uh, and then uh, the law of return means that we take out, we put back in, but you don't need to put back in 20 times the phosphorus and zinc that, that you take out, for instance. Thanks again, Mark. Um, we're looking forward to the remaining two webinars in this series, all of which are going to be archived at that link on your screen. And we hope that everyone can join us for the other webinars in this series, as well as any other eOrganic webinars this season, which you can find simply by typing webinars by eOrganic into a search engine. So thanks everyone for joining us. Okay, thank you. Bye.